We're going to talk here about food allergies. This is something that you will run into very frequently if you work with children uh, and occasionally with adults too. Uh, one of the big things with food allergies is patient education and that cannot be stressed enough because in a lot of cases with food allergies it's going to require a change in lifestyle uh, for these patients and for their families and so you want to be aware of how to teach these patients and families uh, how they're going to cope and how they're going to adjust to their new lifestyle regimen uh, to avoid these food allergens. Um, so that takes that takes a different level of knowledge. It's one thing to be able to know what to do and know how to manage patients yourself or to teach other physicians or to teach medical students it's a totally different thing to understand how to teach patients how to take care of things. And in addition to that, these patients are also going to need to teach other family members, and they're going to need to teach, uh, in some cases, teachers and coaches who might not be used to dealing with this because and this typically happens in children with food allergies. It's more prevalent in children. Uh, these children are going to be at school, they're going to be at daycare, they're going to be at church group, what have you, and the parent is going to need to teach the babysitter or the coach, and so it's important that you teach the parent and that the parent has a really good understanding of all of this so that they can go on and make sure that they're informing uh, all the individuals that need to be aware of this, because really anybody with extended contact with the child needs to be alerted and aware of how to manage in an emergency, how to manage uh, a, an allergic crisis. So patient education features very prominently here and so you want to be aware not only how you manage food allergies and acute allergic reactions but also how to teach patients to deal with it on their own because in a lot of cases uh, if it's a severe enough allergic reaction they're not going to be able to get to the hospital soon enough. All right, so here is our vignette. A five-year-old girl is rushed to the ED by her father because of a sudden rash. Dad is very concerned and says that she has been well up until now, and nothing like this has ever happened before. She's stable, but an obvious rash is visible on her face and arms, which she is itching at. On talking to Dad, he says that he is not aware of any food allergies. He denies any other symptoms, including fever or vomiting. She is not presently on any medications. She, is, uh, she has no significant medical history. Blood pressure is 100 over 60, heart rate 100, respiration is 22, temperature 97.9. Physical reveals multiple soft raised erythematous lesions over her face, arms, and torso. No other type of rash is appreciated. Lips, tongue, and oral mucosa appear normal. There is no swelling of the hands or feet. Lungs are clear to auscultation. Abdomen is non-tender, non-descended, and normal bowel sounds. So obviously, this is a child with acute urticaria. We know that based on the pattern of the rash and that it, that it occurred suddenly. Acute urticaria typically will come up uh, within an hour after, uh, after ingesting whatever uh, is allergenic. Uh, and so it stands apart from things, uh, I don't know what else might look like this, uh, but it stands apart from a lot of other rashes, which are usually a little more insidious. So uh, what we want to, when we have a child or any patient with urticaria, one of the things that can accompany urticaria, because it is typically due to an allergic reaction, one of the things that can accompany it is angioedema. And angioedema is, uh, it can be life-threatening if it's severe enough. Most of the time, it's not. Uh, but if it is severe enough, then uh, it can be life-threatening. And so what do we want to look for? We want to look for swelling, and particularly swelling uh, of the oropharynx, anywhere uh, that can obstruct the respiratory tract. So we want to look at the lips, the tongue, the back of the oropharynx. We want to listen to see if there's any wheezing. Uh, looking at the patient grossly to see if there's any respiratory distress. There's not here. So here we have a child that's uh, vitally stable. Uh, if, you know, the, the vital signs are a little bit different in children. Uh, usually the blood pressure is a little bit lower. Heart rate's a little higher. Respirations are a little bit higher. Depends on the age. 
Uh, here, heart rate of 100, that's not the upper limit of normal in, the, in a child this age. This is right in the middle. Uh, respirations are, are normal. 22 would be high in an adult, but this is normal in a child. So this child is, is, is vitally stable. Uh, there's no s swelling or edema of the respiratory tract. Uh, and so all we have here is acute urticaria. And that is good in that this child is not in a life-threatening situation right now. Now, that having been said, you can have urticaria and go on to develop angioedema if you're not treated. So, this does not mean the child shouldn't be treated. This child needs to be treated. And if a child has hives, uh, urticaria, hives, urticaria, same thing. Uh, but if a child has something like this, they do need to be treated. Uh, so... Uh, other things that we want to look out for, uh, we want to listen to the lungs. If there's any wheezing whatsoever, uh, then you're going to want to administer epinephrine rather than uh, like an antihistamine, uh, which we could get by with in this patient. So other things, uh, no fever and vomiting. Uh, fever would be atypical. Vomiting can be present in an acute allergic reaction. They can get significant enough abdominal pain, and abdominal pain itself can trigger vomiting. Uh, this is a very itchy rash and consistent with urticaria, uh, but the abdomen is otherwise normal. So this is not like uh, a gastroenteritis or anything. Uh, and you, you can see in some cases with food allergies, abdominal pain is the prominent feature. Uh, and so, uh, and, and we're going to also see some of the manifestations of allergy, more cell-mediated manifestations are, uh, can feature abdominal pain and diarrhea and vomiting, and that can look a lot like gastroenteritis. And so, uh, but that's not what's happening in this patient. So, the diagnosis here is acute urticaria. We don't need to do any blood workup or, or really anything else. It's a clinical diagnosis, and what we would do in the case of this patient would be to administer antihistamine, uh, like Benadryl, uh, and observe for probably about an hour in the ED. And what should happen is that within an hour, the rash, it's not going to go away, but it should become a little bit less erythematous, and certainly it shouldn't be as itchy. And then you're going to prescribe, uh, she's going to be taking uh, antihistamines for a day or two every six hours, and then as needed until it resolves. You would want to make sure that this patient follows up within a week with her primary care physician, uh, and then uh, probably consultation with an allergist, uh, or you could just establish an action plan uh, with the primary care physician. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, in patients that have new, newly established food allergies, uh, we want to get them uh, in contact with an allergist. Uh, important here that she's not on any medications, so that pretty much means that this is a food allergy. It's not very common. Uh, it's much more common to develop food allergies younger in life, one, two, three years of age. Five is on the older end, although we will see that there are some food allergies that can develop later on in life, even in adulthood. Um, so when you have an older patient who develops allergies for the first time, what you want to look out for are medications because medications, something like penicillin or amoxicillin, you might not take for the first time until you're nine, 10 years old, for instance, and then you can get a reaction to that. So you always want to know if there's medication history, and that's just good for, for any patient. You want to know if they're on medications, and she's not. So this is most likely a food allergy. You're going to want to ask even... Uh, even before you send the patient home, you want to get a good idea of what has she ate in the last 24 hours. Particularly, what did she eat today before she came in, a few hours uh, before she came in. Uh, and uh, so you can get a good idea of what she should avoid between now and when she gets a good allergy workup. So we'll talk about epidemiology, pathogenesis. This is a type 1 reaction here, so you probably already have an idea of how that works. If you've watched some of these other lectures, we'll talk about the common offending foods. That is important to be aware of because depending on the food, it can manifest at different times. So milk allergies tend to show up very early on in life. 
whereas things like shellfish allergies may not manifest until adulthood. And these allergies, a lot of them will go away with time, whereas some of them, like peanut allergies, tend to stick around for life. Uh, we'll talk about the clinical manifestations. There are a ton of manifestations from allergies. So we saw this patient had urticaria. This is a classic manifestation of acute allergy, but there are a lot of other things, including GI symptoms, uh, systemic symptoms, anaphylaxis. Uh, there are respiratory manifestations. So there are a lot of different manifestations of allergy uh, that you'll want to be aware of. A diagnosis, uh, how we go about diagnosing this, primarily clinical. However, uh, immunoglobulin E uh, titers can be useful in narrowing down what our possible offending allergen is. We'll talk about how you manage this. Like I said, a lot of this is going to be based on patient education. We'll talk about the complications from the prognosis. All right, so food allergies are a heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous allergic symptoms which are caused by antigenic proteins in food. So food is a foreign substance. Of course, we eat food uh, as a necessary part of staying alive, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate the fact that food are antigenic proteins. They're not part of our body. Now, the body does a pretty good job at ignoring these antigens. And you have in your gut, you have something called gut, gut associated lymphoid tissue, and it does a pretty good job of ignoring food allergens for one reason or another. You know, you've got your your uh, T regulatory cells and all of that cell biology down there, uh, but for the most part, it does a pretty good job. However, very early on in life, uh, so less than a year of age. That, that tissue is not quite fully matured, the immune system is not fully matured, and the physical barrier of the gut is not fully developed. And so, for that reason, children who are very young, um, infants, probably I would say up to, uh, up to 12 to 18 months of age, are going to be more likely to develop food allergies because that physical barrier of their GI tract and because their immune system, which remember is not just developing allergic reactions, but also preventing allergic reactions. We have sort of a balance there. We have our T regulatory cells, which prevent allergic reactions. That system is not fully developed yet. And so it is that period before about 12 to 18 months of age where a lot of these food allergies are gonna show up for the first time. Also, the fact that as, the, as children get older, infants grow, you're introducing new foods to them. So that's another reason uh, as well. And you're not going to see peanut allergies in, in a four-day-old four baby. You shouldn't be giving peanuts to four-day-old babies. So it really you know, depends on the foods you're introducing. And for that reason, we prefer that parents introduce one food at a time as appropriate. It's difficult to characterize the epidemiology. Oh, I should go into how, how, how frequent this is. So 3.5% of the general population in the U.S. has food allergies. That's a lot higher in children and infants. So 6% of children and 8% of infants. And by infants, uh, where I got this, uh, I believe they're referring to 12 months of age or younger. So you can see that it becomes less prevalent as they get older. And we'll see when we look at the, the different foods and when they come on and uh, when they resolve that a lot of these will resolve around early childhood, six, seven years of age. Uh, of these allergies, the most prevalent overall is cow's milk, and that allergy tends to go away. Uh, egg accounts for about one and a half percent of the general population. Again, that's something that tends to go away. And then peanut allergies is about 1% of the population, and that is something that typically will stick with the patient for life. So uh, as far as the epidemiology, it is very difficult to characterize because a lot of these are done via survey, and patients are typically not aware of the difference between allergy and intolerance. Now, allergy, of course, is defined by a specific physiological response. Uh, it's uh, type 1 immune-mediated response where you're getting the release of those mediators like histamine. Uh, and so that is allergy. Now, food intolerance, on the other hand, 
can be a variety of different things. For instance, lactose intolerance, where you don't have the enzyme lactase, and so you have all that extra lactose in your gut, bacteria eats it, and uh, the bacteria f uh, ferments uh, gas, and uh, ultimately you're going to have malabsorption, and so that's lactose intolerance. That's not an allergic reaction. However, it is an intolerance in that when the children drink milk, they get a reaction from it, but it's not an allergic reaction. So important that you understand that and you differentiate that because the way we would treat lactose intolerance is not with uh, with epinephrine or with uh, with Benadryl. It's going to be with avoidance, which is kind of similar to how we treat food allergies. But uh, important to understand the difference between food intolerance and food allergies. And there's a lot of other ones. The one I want to bring your attention to is salicylate intolerance. The reason I want to bring your attention to this is because this does look a lot like allergy. So with salicylate intolerance, uh, this is not just intolerance to aspirin, uh, aminosalicylic acid, I believe, ASA. Uh, but this is also a reaction to any food that can contain salicylates, and there's a lot of them. So teas, coffee, uh, dried herbs and spices, green apples, fruit juices, dried fruit, wine, peppermint, licorice, lots of different random foods have a high concentration of salicylates. And so it, this can trigger a lot of things that look a lot like food allergy, but you want to be aware of what foods trigger these symptoms because if it does fall into the salicylate intolerance, that's going to be different. Uh, so some of the symptoms that can come out of salicylate intolerance, I'm not going to talk about this at length, but you can see how they look a lot like allergies, things like stomach pain, itchy skin, hives, rash, uh, asthma, nasal polyps, tinnitus, angioedema. So you get a lot of similar symptoms to allergy, but this is technically not an allergic response. Uh, other things that patients might come at you and say, oh, my kid has an allergy, idiosyncratic reaction, so a certain food causes the patient to vomit. That is not an allergic reaction uh, in, in most cases. Some foods can pr provoke migraines, things like chocolate. Uh, that is not an allergy. Okay, So this is food intolerance different from food allergies. Food allergies, like all allergies, are increasing in prevalence in developed countries. And as I've mentioned in some of the other lectures, if you are an immigrant from a developing country, um, so most parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, you're more likely to develop allergies just by immigrating to a developed country. So it is an environmental factor, not a genetic factor. Among children, males tend to be more affected with food allergies than females. However, among adults, females tend to be more frequently affected than males. This is the uh, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that we see in, uh, in food allergies. We see it in various other things, asthma. Uh, you see it in acute, uh, allergic rhinitis, allergic conjunctivitis. Um, so this is really all over the place, but uh, this is how it works with food. You get the allergen, uh, the allergenic protein comes in. Typically, you would this would end here, and you would not get presentation of the antibody to uh, these cells. Uh, but in the case of uh, allergic patients, uh, there's a presentation of the antibody to the allergen-specific T cell. Uh, this is going to stimulate Th2 cells to release various cytokines, which stimulate the B cell to type switch to IgE. And IgE then can lock and load the mast cell, which then on repeated exposure, that allergenic protein will uh, will lock on to the IgE, the cell-associated IgE, and then trigger the release of mast cell mediators, which chief, uh, chiefly include histamines, uh, but also can include uh, leukotrienes and other cytokines, prostaglandins. And then these are some of the symptoms which we're going to talk about. Common offending foods. So I put these sort of in order of when they would show up in life. So the first one that usually shows up, uh, and it can happen earlier than this, but this is the usual age of onset, it's roughly 6 to 12 months, and that's cow's milk. Now, cow's milk 
has a high cross reactivity with goat or sheep milk. What that means is that if the patient is allergic to cow's milk, they're probably going to be allergic to goat or sheep milk in 92% of cases. The usual age of resolution uh, is going to be 70, or it's going to be five years of age. 76% of cases are resolved by five years of age. That being said, I want you to know this as a general rule. Children under the age of one should not be getting cow's milk. Uh, egg white can come on uh, usually under the age of two. This there's a cross reactivity between other avian eggs. Typically, we have like I think chicken eggs, uh, but other eggs that come from birds uh, can cause an allergic response too in patients that are allergic to hen eggs. Uh, this usually resolves around age seven. Peanuts, so the ones in the blue here are the ones that tend to persist in life. They don't go away. Uh, so peanut age or peanut allergy will happen around uh, before two years of age. Average age is about 14 months. There will be a cross reactivity here with other legumes. What are legumes? Uh, there are peas, garbanzo beans, lentil, alfalfa, soybeans, peanuts, etc. There's a lot of other things that are classified as legumes. Those are all going to be things that the patient will want to avoid. Uh, they'll also have a tendency to also be allergic to tree nuts. And tree nuts are uh, things like I think, almonds and walnuts and Brazil nuts. Uh, this is persistent. This will typically not go away. About 80 to 90 percent of cases will persist into adulthood. Wheat is a more commonly now recognized allergen than it was before. Uh, this is, can cause celiac disease and this can go into adulthood as well. Uh, 6 to 24 months of age is the uh, usual age of onset. These patients tend to be uh, reactive to other grains with gluten like rye and barley. Uh, the usual age of resolution is five years of age. However, if they develop it later in life, and there are patients who do develop it later in life, we'll talk about celiac disease, how celiac disease can be silent, and then you can just develop it in adulthood. Most of the cases then will not resolve. Uh, but if it's developed very early on in childhood, they, they more than likely will resolve with time. Soybeans, uh, this is a legume. Uh, this can uh, this is, works a little bit differently in that uh, soybeans. Uh, so with soybeans, I'm talking primarily here about soy-based formulas that we give to infants. Uh, that can cause allergy. Looks a lot like the cow's milk allergy as far as how it comes on and uh, the symptoms that it manifests, mostly GI. Uh, this will have a cross reactivity with other legumes. This tends to go away by two years of age, and usually by that point they're not on formula anymore. I kind of talked about tree nuts already. Fish, this is a big one. This tends to come on later in life, so I, some of these won't show up until adulthood. These will be cross reactive to most other fish, however, they're usually tuna and swordfish are not cross reactive. So they'll be allergic to trout, and they'll be allergic to uh, walleye, but they won't be allergic to tuna or swordfish. However, they probably want to avoid it anyway. Uh, rosaceae fruits, so that's a lot of different fruits. Uh, apples, pears, apricots, plums, cherries, peaches, raspberries, uh, you name it. Uh, and then carrots. Uh, this can, again, come on later on. We're going to, I'm going to show you in a little bit, uh, but this kind of falls into a different sort of allergy mechanism. Uh, these patients tend to be allergic to birch pollen and that they get seasonal allergies. Uh, and then there's a cross reactivity with nuts in some cases. Uh, shellfish, this uh, usually, more often than not, won't come on until adulthood. This is things like uh, clams and mollusks and crab. Uh, this uh, usually persists for life, and then kiwi is kind of a, kind of an outlier, but good to know with kiwi allergy, these patients also tend to be allergic to latex. Okay, so I think I've belabored that enough. Class 1 versus class 2 food allergens. This is a good thing to be aware of. It can be useful clinically, uh, at least in establishing what the possible offending allergen is. Uh, so a class 1 food allergen can be any food. And that I do want to bring up. 
uh, any food can cause hypersensitivity. So not just limited to these ones that I showed you. These are the more prevalent ones, but any food can cause allergy. Uh, so any food can serve as a class one allergen. Uh, most common are like the ones I told you about, eggs, milk, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, soy, and wheat. The way that this works is that the allergen gets into the gut, it crosses the gut mucosa, about 2% of all food proteins will get into the bloodstream, uh, and that can trigger an allergic reaction. Most of the times it doesn't, but in the cases it does, uh, that's how it works with these class 1 food allergens. It crosses the gut and results in an immune reaction, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. On the other hand, class 2 food allergens, these work differently. So what happens with class 2 food allergens is that you have some kind of environmental allergen. Usually it's birch or ragweed, and that's in the environment, and you breathe that in. This is just like how seasonal allergies work, which can cause rhinitis and conjunctivitis and asthma. That allergen comes into your respiratory tract and then triggers an immune reaction, as it normally does, uh, and that can have cross-reactivity with various food allergens in some patients. And so what you have is an immune response, a sensitization to the birch or to the ragweed, and then that causes you to be allergic to certain foods. So it works differently. These patients tend to be allergic to things like fruits, uh, nuts, and melons. Uh, and a good thing to be aware of here is that these patients will also tend to have seasonal allergies. Now, in general, patients with food allergies are more likely to have other atopic diseases. They're more likely to have allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. They're more likely to have asthma. They're more likely to have eczema. Uh, but these patients that are allergic to fruits and melons and hazelnut, uh, they will typically have seasonal allergies because what are they allergic to? They're allergic to birch and ragweed, and that just happened to cause a cross-reactivity with these foods. It, also good to know that uh, with these fruits, typically the way that these cause allergies is by a protein that is heat label. And so if you use, like, if, for instance, they had apple pie where the apples are cooked, or uh, if they had carrots that are cooked down, or uh, potatoes that are boiled that's not going to cause allergy, but if they ate into a fresh apple or had carrot sticks, that will cause allergy. So here's the clinical manifestations we're going to talk about. There's a ton. Uh, I will point you out towards the ones that you want to be most aware of. So hopefully you won't have to memorize all of these, although you should have an idea just based on general allergies uh, what these are. Uh, so I don't want to belabor this too much. Uh, I don't want to cram your head with too much information that won't be useful for the test, but you can always come back and look at this if you want to get more. Okay, so what happens to the skin? Atopic dermatitis is a very common manifestation of food allergy. About 30% of patients with eczema will have a food allergy. And a lot of times with those patients with eczema, and eczema is pretty common, it's about 10% of the population, those patients who have eczema in relation to a food allergy, by withdrawing that food, you will dramatically improve their eczema. So always good with a patient with atopic dermatitis, always good to uh, look into possible food allergies. This is a dry pruritic maculopapular rash. I talked about this at length in another lecture. You can go back and look at that if you want. Uh, but this will usually manifest early on in life, uh, and uh, it's just an itchy, scaly rash. Uh, derma der dermatitis herpetiformis. Uh, so this is a sort of blistery rash. It's symmetrical. Uh, they tend to develop it on their hands and feet, uh, but it can really be anywhere. It looks like eczema. But rather than dry and scaly, it's more blistery. It will, this will also be itchy, too. Now, when you see dermatitis herpetiformis, this is usually a sign of celiac disease. This, it can happen in any allergy, but usually this will occur in conjunction with celiac disease, which is the gluten enteropathy, which we'll talk about. Acute urticaria and angioedema. We saw the acute urticaria in our patient in the vignette. Acute urticaria is just the sudden appearance of these raised pruritic lesions. They're very itchy. We call these wheels. 
Uh, we saw a picture of that. These are self-limited. Often they're associated with other allergic symptoms, which can include angioedema. Uh, it can include uh, anaphylactic shock, wheezing. Uh, so a lot of times you, you get urticaria alone, but in some cases you can get urticaria in association with other allergic symptoms. Uh, acute angioedema is a little bit more scary because this can cause uh, a, an obstruction of the upper respiratory tract. So usually this will manifest as swelling of the lips, tongue, uh, and face, uh, but it can also cause swelling, edema of the, uh, the hands and feet. Any patient that has acute urticaria, you should be looking very closely for angioedema. GI manifestations. Okay, I want you to get these three things straight because they sound a lot alike. They're all food protein induced something, uh, but they are a little bit different. Okay, first of all, food protein induced enterocolitis. This is often abbreviated FPIES. Uh, it's just food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Uh, this, the way this usually presents is it's a 10 month old baby coming in with Bloodied, uh, bloody stool in the diaper, otherwise healthy, uh, maybe a history of vomiting, uh, and then you elicit a history and you find out that mom and dad gave the baby cow's milk. That is classic food protein induced enterocolitis. What you're getting is an allergic response in the GI tract, which is causing sloughing off of the mucosa and then subsequently bleeding into the stool. This will usually occur shortly after exposure to the allergenic food, and so you can get protracted vomiting, you can get diarrhea, and in a lot of cases, it can cause bloody diarrhea. And if this, if you get repeat exposure, and the patient's not brought in for one reason or another, if there's repeated exposure to usually it's cow's milk, uh, then ultimately you can get anemia from all that blood loss and with significant enough vomiting, you can get dehydration. The way that this looks in severe cases looks a lot like sepsis. So think about it. You have dehydration that causes low blood pressure. Uh, you get vomiting that looks like something maybe from an infection. You get diarrhea, maybe enterocolitis. You can get sepsis from that. Uh, and it's acute. So it can look a lot like sepsis. Uh, just based on the low blood pressure, uh, the fact that they look dehydrated and that they've had these symptoms that may be infection related. And so in many cases it gets confused with sepsis. If you're ever confused, if you have food protein induced enterocolitis on your differential and sepsis on your differential, you are going to treat the sepsis. You are going to treat with empiric antibiotics, get blood cultures, and then you can look into possibly enterocolitis. These patients will get better by removing the cow's milk. If a, if a child that's 10 months of age is in the hospital, we damn well are not going to be giving them cow's milk. So this will resolve, uh, whereas sepsis will uh, get worse if you don't give them antibiotics. So I just want you to know that this can look like sepsis. It can be very, very tricky to distinguish the two. One of the ways that you can distinguish them is that with this enterocolitis, uh, this allergic enterocolitis, they will not have a fever. However, with sepsis, it's variable. They can have a fever. They may even be hypothermic. Uh, their white count can be elevated, I believe. Uh, I'm trying to remember the distinguishing factor uh, can't remember. Uh, there are some uh, there are some ways that you can differentiate this out, but uh, for the most part, uh, this will go away just by removing the uh, the offending source. Okay, uh, food protein induced proctocolitis. This is similar to the enterocolitis, but this is just limited to the colon. Uh, so this usually manifests again during infancy. It's just blood streak stools in an otherwise healthy baby. So they don't come in looking like uh, this very ill child that has vomiting and diarrhea and dehydration. It's just blood streak stools. This can also be caused by cow's milk. However, the majority of cases are caused by something in the maternal diet and that comes in to the breast milk and causes an allergic reaction there. So this can be a little bit trickier to diagnose because you have to get a 
uh, food history on the mom. Uh, and so mom might need to modify her diet. Uh, food protein induced enteropathy. So this is different from food protein induced enterocolitis. Food protein induced enteropathy is more of a chronic process. Enterocolitis develops about one to three hours after feeding. With food protein induced enteropathy, it's going to be a more chronic process. And in addition to that, we see in a lot of cases poor weight gain and failure to thrive. Uh, the reason this happens is because of malabsorption. Uh, so if you get enough inflammation in the small intestine, you're not going to be able to absorb nutrients, uh, in particular proteins and fats, and as a result of that, it's going to come out in the stool, that's going to cause steatorrhea, you're going to get decreased caloric intake because you're not absorbing fats and proteins, uh, and so that's going to cause poor weight gain and failure to thrive. The abdominal distension is going to be caused by bacteria eating up that sugar, and uh, that's going to cause gas. Uh, the most common cause is cow's milk in infants. Uh, so celiac disease is a fo food protein induced enteropathy, and uh, it's the same mechanism that's working here. Uh, this can manifest at any age, and this is due to wheat products, particularly a protein found in uh, wheat and in rye and barley called gliadin. And there are tests that you can do specifically for celiac disease. You'll do an endoscopy with a biopsy of uh, small intestine tissue, and then you can get various serologies. Uh, eosinophilic esophagitis can present at any age. Uh, it manifests as chronic refractory gastroesophageal reflux. A lot of times you'll diagnose these patients with GERD, and then you'll give them um, you'll give them things like uh, H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors, and it doesn't respond. And it also won't respond to things like avoiding food before bed and behavioral modifications. Uh, so this is an allergic response which can cause, which causes inflammation along the esophagus. And ultimately, if this is severe enough and goes on uh, without uh, intervention, uh, you can get strictures and stuff like that. Allergic eosinophilic gastroenteritis is similar to uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, but it can also it, it also affects uh, more distal parts of the GI tract, uh, and this, because of inflammation of the small intestine, can cause weight loss and failure to thrive because it's going to interfere with absorption. So, to differentiate this out. Uh, this is going to mandate a biopsy. But the nice thing is when you do get a biopsy, it's pretty easy uh, for the pathologist to read because you're just looking for eosinophils uh, in, in, the, uh, in the tissue. And that will give you your diagnosis. Oral allergy syndrome, this is an IgE-mediated response, so it will come on right away after you consume the food. And it's a rapid onset of oral pruritus, so it's kind of itchiness around the oral mucosa and maybe on the lips. Uh, a lot of patients re uh, will, will refer to this as like a tingling sensation of the lips, and you can also get angioedema. Uh, most commonly, this is caused by the heat label protein allergies, so allergies to fruit like apples and strawberries and cherries, uh, also uh, some nuts uh, and uh, melon and banana and stuff like that. So those those class two allergens. Uh, and remember, they do have to be raw. Acute GI allergy. This is uh, another IgE mediated response. This is typically abdominal pain and vomiting. A lot of times you'll see this in conjunction with other allergic symptoms like hives and angioedema and anaphylaxis. Okay, so I believe, okay, what it, I do, did want to go back to here. So with enterocolitis and proctocolitis, because this can cause blood, bl blood in the stool, particularly enterocolitis, where they can look really ill, think of some of the things that you want to, to have on your differential, some really severe things. So you want to consider if it's a very young child, you always want to be worried about neck, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, so you'll want to get an x-ray. Uh, because if the child is really young, uh, if, let's say this happened at two weeks of age, it can be neck. And we want to differentiate that out because that's a surgical 
uh, emergency, if that is indeed the case, and uh, that's going to require a lot different management. So an, an abdominal x-ray may not be out of place. Uh, so we're talking about bloody diarrhea in a very young child. You've got to think of all those surgical uh, problems. So in a susception is another thing you might want to be worried about. Protracted vomiting, also think about uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Uh, so I want you to be aware that you're going to come across this. You've got a big differential here. So look at the symptoms. It really depends on the presentation. If they're not presenting with protracted vomiting, but they are presenting with bloody diarrhea, then your differential is going to include things like neck and intussusception. But if it's mostly protracted vomiting, which can be a presentation of food protein-induced enterocolitis, then you may uh, consider hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, particularly if this is a boy around two, three, four months of age. Okay. Uh, respiratory manifestations include food-induced rhinoconjunctivitis. This is just a type 1 mediated response. Uh, it looks just like allergic rhinitis and allergic conjunctivitis. You get the tearing, nasal congestion, runny nose. Uh, usually this is going to be accompanied by allergic symptoms elsewhere. Bronchospasm can happen. That's not a diagnosis. That's just a symptom. Anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. This is what we're always worried about. This is the worst thing that can happen with food allergies. So this is life-threatening. It's a medical emergency. Uh, this is a systemic allergic reaction, which it doesn't have to include all of these, but these are all potential manifestations of anaphylaxis. So dermatologically, you, get, you can get hives and angioedema. Respiratory, we're worried about obstruction due to bronchospasm. So you can get wheezing, shortness of breath, hoarseness, cough. Nasal congestion, that would probably be a manifestation of right conjunctivitis. Cardiovascular, you can get, uh, what we're most worried about is uh, the hypotension, which is mediated by uh, the allergic response with the histamine. Uh, you can also get arrhythmias, and that can cause palpitations, and the combination of these all can cause the dizziness and syncope. Uh, the GI tract, we've already talked about this, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, dysphagia, diarrhea. Neurologically, these are going to be less common, so I'm not even going to talk about that. Uh, so usually when a patient comes in with anaphylaxis, in, with children, uh, their respiratory symptoms are going to predominate first, and then their skin symptoms will predominate later. And that is in contrast to adults. With adults, Usually it's the skin symptoms first and the respiratory symptoms later. So they'll get hives and then they'll get difficulty breathing. With children, the respiratory symptoms come on first. Now, I looked up in the literature why that is. I couldn't get a definitive response, but just my own thinking about it. Think about a child's respiratory tract. It's smaller. And with Poissil's Law, they have less ability to deal with obstruction because obstruction is, or their ability to uh, bring in oxygen is inversely related to uh, the or is related to the fourth power of the radius and so uh, with children it doesn't take much to cause them to go into respiratory distress much swelling all right for diagnosis uh, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis in most cases but first of all it's important to understand the type of symptoms that predominate because that's going to help you distinguish whether this is a food allergy or a food intolerance. You also want to know uh, whether or not uh, this is more of an acute IgE-mediated response. So certainly if they're getting hives and angioedema, abdominal pain, that is consistent with an acute IgE-mediated response, whereas if it is something more like uh, vomiting, uh, if it's uh, uh, diarrhea or uh, steatorrhea or um, things, things that aren't skin related or, uh, or acute abdominal pain or respiratory related basically, uh, then that is, falls under more of those cell mediated disorders. Uh, so you want to know the difference uh, between those because with the 
with, with the IgE mediated disorder, so if it's causing urticaria, angioedema, uh, if it's causing anaphylaxis, the skin prick tests and in vitro tests are useful. But if it is, uh, if the manifestation is celiac related, uh, or if it's eosinophilic esophagitis, or if it's uh, food protein induced enterocolitis, then the skin prick tests are really not that useful. So depending on whether it's acute or cell mediated, uh, you can go in a variety of different directions. So if it's an acute allergic reaction, you can get IgE antibody screening, you can get skin prick testing. Uh, a negative IgE is going to rule out hypersensitivity to that allergen. On the other hand, if it's positive, that's not necessarily diagnostic, but it certainly doesn't rule it out, so you want to do more further testing. Uh, so the way you usually follow this up, if you get a positive IgE uh, to a, something that you think the patient might be allergic to, you're going to do an oral food challenge and see if you can repeat or if you can uh, if you can replicate the symptoms. Now the only exception to that is going to be if the patient had anaphylaxis, if they had a severe reaction. Uh, so if they had wheezing and they required epinephrine, then you're just going to make the diagnosis at that point clinically with the positive IgE alone. Uh, however, if they just had things like hives, like the child that we saw, uh, then you can do a supervised oral food challenge. This is supervised. You're not sending them home and say, go eat peanuts. You, this is going to be a supervised challenge where you're already with epinephrine and everything right there. If this is a, more of a cell-mediated reaction, then the first thing we think of is to do some kind of diagnostic testing. So it really depends on the manifestations. Uh, if it's suspected celiac disease, you're going to want to do an endoscopy with biopsy, also serology for anti-TTG and anti-gliadin antibodies. The two of those together are really good at establishing the diagnosis. If it's something like uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, if it's got refractory GERD, um, not responsive to treatment, and it's a, a child, then you get the endoscopy and biopsy and look for the eosinophils on histology. Um, you can follow that up then with a trial elimination diet. You eliminate one food at a time and see if it goes away. Uh, and then uh, you, if, if it goes away, then you do an oral food challenge to see if that was truly it. So you're, you're doing elimination and then challenge. Uh, so you reintroduce the food, and if the symptoms come back, then you've made your diagnosis. Most of the time, an allergist is going to be doing all this diagnostic battery, but it's good to be aware of how this works. For management, uh, we, of course, want to appropriately identify the offending allergen and eliminate it from the diet. That's the best overall therapy for food allergy, right? Just eliminating it from the diet, you're going to prevent a lot of these symptoms. We want to refer them to an allergist, and the big reason here is, first of all, it can be very difficult to make the diagnosis. You think, oh, well, I just get an IgE panel, and that will give me my diagnosis. No, it's really not that easy because there are so many different foods that can cause these allergies. You can't just get an IgE panel on everything. We can look for some of the more common things like peanuts and wheat and milk, egg whites, uh, but it may be something else. And so an allergist will be able to pin this down a lot easier. Another reason why we want to refer them to an allergist is for periodic reevaluation. Now you might think, why do they need to be reevaluated? They get diagnosed with allergy. It's why not just have them on the diet where they eliminate the allergen and they're good to go for life. Well, remember that a lot of these will remit with, with time. And so the allergist will reevaluate them, and they know when these allergies tend to go away, and they can uh, help decide when the food can be reintroduced. Because remember, you're talking about changing the diet. We're talking about an, a, a child that may have a severe allergic reaction at age 3, but by age 12, it's gone. They're fine. They can eat uh, milk or egg whites or what have you. Uh, and so when they are young, they do need to avoid this. And it's not as easy as just eliminating the food macroscopically. 
these allergens can be present in trace amounts in a lot of different things and so this is really a lifestyle modification for these patients and it can be really significant especially you know when you're dealing with families where they have to d worry about cross-contamination they have to uh, worry about uh, whether or not they can go to certain restaurants and have certain things prepared certain ways uh, and so when the child is no longer allergic, the family's going to want to know because then they can go back to their regular old lifestyle. So this is, in general, why you want to have these patients in contact with an allergist. A referral to a nutritionist, dietitian, particularly one that specializes in, uh, in allergy diets, uh, is good to help uh, with education regarding how they can plan a diet and how they can also avoid defending food. That's a big part of patient education. It's not just, okay, I'm allergic to peanuts, I'm not gonna eat peanuts. Peanuts can be in a lot of different foods like Chinese food, Thai food, some Indian foods, uh, and you might not be aware of it. Uh, it can also be present in, you can get cross-contamination. So let's say that you go to a Chinese restaurant and you order sesame chicken, which does not have peanuts in it, but it was cooked in the same pan as your Kung Pao chicken, which has peanuts in it. There you get cross-contamination. That can be deadly. Uh, so uh, that being said, it's, it, there's a lot of things that these patients will need to learn about. Patient family education, of course, we already talked about that. That's critical. And there are specialists that you can get them in touch with. There's support groups. There's brochures. Um, and they may come to you with questions and you can answer them as necessary. There's a lot of different things uh, that they may ask you about. Uh, those with IgE-mediated allergies, uh, so any kind of acute reaction, so if they had the oral allergy syndrome, uh, if they had uh, certainly uh, any kind of anaphylactic reaction, uh, if they had hives, uh, all of these patients uh, should be provided an EpiPen. Uh, at, at least two. And the reason is because you never know when it may get worse. Okay, so like this patient we had, she just had hives. However, the next time she comes into contact with that food, it may be total anaphylaxis where she cannot breathe. She's totally closed up. Uh, and so we do not want to send her home with with nothing because if she runs into it again, remember that this is a sensitization uh, process. So the next, the, the next exposure is could possibly be worse. So anybody with an IgE-mediated allergy, an acute response, anybody with allergy to peanuts or nuts, and anybody with a history of severe reaction should be provided with a self-injectable epinephrine pen, also known as an EpiPen and a written action plan. A written action plan is basically a uh, something that is, it's, it's a piece of paper uh, and what you write down in it is uh, it's a template and you write down the patient's allergy to what foods it is and it also then has instructions on how to use the EpiPen. It also shows uh, what, it, it's basically a, a, an instruction tool for uh, like a coach or a teacher or a babysitter. And it'll show the various symptoms and then how to use the EpiPen uh, and, so, and then what to do. So the rule is act first, call later. So get the EpiPen, uh, get the epinephrine injected first, then call 911. Don't call 911 and then give the EpiPen. You want to do, you want to treat first, call later. Uh, and then uh, it can it also provides information like uh, you should call 911 and it gives information regarding uh, the doctor's contact information and all that stuff. So that's a written action plan. Uh, I'll provide you a link so you can see what it looks like and this you want to provide to all patients and this should be given to anybody, a copy of this action plan should be given to anybody that has prolonged or extended contact with a child. So school nurse certainly uh, coach, so like basketball coach or whatever, uh, babysitter, uh, if it's an older person, you may give it to their uh, somebody at their work, like supervisor or somebody that they work with frequently, uh, or anyone that has contact with the patient. At the very least, what you want to make sure is that they know how to use the EpiPen, because that's really the most important thing. Most people know to call 911 
at some point. All right, uh, complications here uh, it really depends on uh, which symptom predominates, but if we're looking at chronic inflammation, uh, which can be due to eosinophil esophagitis or uh, gastroenteritis, uh, that can result in strictures. And so these patients, you'll want to refer them to a gastroenterologist uh, no matter what, uh, so that this is being managed appropriately. Undiagnosed food protein-induced enteropathies can result in failure to thrive because of malabsorption. That can cause growth delay and retardation. Uh, that's growth retardation, not mental retardation. Uh, and then repeat ED visits, uh, which can be taxing and expensive. The most feared complication, of course, is anaphylactic shock, which is life-threatening. Okay, so for prognosis, um, most of these allergies, as we saw, are going to remit with age. However, allergies to nuts and shellfish tend to persist. So if a patient comes to you asking, am I going to be allergic forever? If it's a peanut allergy, a tree nut allergy, or a shellfish allergy, the answer is probably yes. If it's an allergy to egg whites or milk, the answer is probably no. Um, but... You have to be, you have to be uh, cleared by your allergist before you go back to eating those things. Uh, anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock are the most severe complications, uh, which can be life-threatening. So ensuring proper patient education is key to improving survival. If you have any questions, go ahead and write me a note below. I will include that link to the action plan so you can see what that looks like. See you next time.